Jesus, we thank you for your rescuing work in the gospel that you would give of yourself, that you would allow your blood to be shed, your body crushed, that you would willingly take the wrath that each one who believes upon you in faith and repentance deserves so that we would no longer fear, so that we would no longer be under condemnation. Thank you so much for your great work. And Lord, now as we open up your word to the book of Colossians yet again, I pray that we would see what we must about you, that we would be fortified in our faith in you as our Savior. And as a result, that we would be conformed more and more into the likeness of your Son, so that we would magnify you and glorify you in all that we do on this earth. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You can open up your Bible to the book of Colossians. Uh, We will be finishing up Colossians this morning. What we used to do in student ministries when I'd say something like that, I'd wait for some sort of verbal response of disappointment. We'll be finishing up the book of Colossians this morning. Oh, guys, that's too kind. So sweet. But then I would follow it up. So this is what your students had to deal with for years. I'd follow it up with some other news, expecting an encouraging response. Like, next week we're going to have a Mission Sunday where we're going to hear a report of what's happening in Papua New Guinea. Hey, okay, you guys catch on quick. Okay, good. We've been working through Colossians, and what we've seen is God's intention for his people to fortify the Colossians in their understanding of the greatness of Christ, his supremacy and his sufficiency, and how Paul is doing that so that these Colossian believers would be able to endure in faithfulness, that they would be fortified in their faith, and that they would press on in faithfulness to God in practical holiness of life and right Christian living. And what's interesting, in all of this amazing lofty explanation regarding Christ, all of the detailed information regarding the believer's separation from the world and union with Christ and the practical outworking of this, and now what we're going to see this morning, Paul closes his letter to the Colossians with detailed greetings and instructions about various individuals over the course of 12 verses. And what we find in this is that deep theological truth is never to be separate from people, from souls. This has been the case all along. This has been true from the very beginning of this letter where we see Paul having such personal affection and care for the church in Colossae whom he hasn't, as far as we can tell, even visited yet. This rich theology we find, isn't meant for each individual alone, but it is to penetrate the heart of every believer who then is joined together in the body with Christ as the head and lives out this union with Christ personally and corporately. And the practical outflow of these glorious truths in the life of the church is what God uses to cause the spiritual growth of the body. Paul knows this. His putting forth the greatness of Christ and his practical instruction was so that the believers who received this letter would, as I mentioned just a moment ago, be fortified in their faith and that they would press on in faithfulness to Jesus. You see, this book isn't a play church kind of instruction. This is radical transformation through Christ that leads to completely different living as one who is in union with Christ. And Paul, or God uses this. God uses this in the lives of his people to conform us more into Christ's likeness as we're useful for the gospel ministry that God has before us. So let's read together these closing words of Paul in the book of Colossians. We're going to be in chapter 4, starting in verse 7, and we'll work our way through the end, verse 18. Starting in verse 7, Paul says, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant or slave in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. 
and with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. They will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas, cousin, Barnabas, cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Well, Paul's closing care for the Colossian church highlights God's instruments for gospel ministry. Paul's closing care for the Colossian church highlights God's instruments for gospel ministry. Paul is bringing his letter to a close and now is giving his parting farewell to them. And in his closing care for the church, what is actually put on display are the instruments, the people God is using to push forward his gospel ministry. And again, as I mentioned earlier, these rich theological truths that Paul has set forth intersect with personal lives real individuals, and we'll watch that unfold this morning. So Paul's closing care for the Colossian church highlights God's instruments for gospel ministry. The first group of instruments for gospel ministry we see is in verses 7 through 9, and that is the faithful representatives being sent. We see the faithful representatives being sent. Paul is sending Tychicus and Onesimus, and he refers to them both as faithful and beloved brethren. Or brothers. First, let's look at what Paul has to say regarding Tychicus. Paul begins by saying, as to all my affairs. Tychicus will bring you information. And in verse 7, Paul refers to Tychicus as our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow slave in the Lord. And it's clear Tychicus was a man of exceptional character. He was loyal and he was faithful. He most likely carried Paul's letter to the Ephesians as well as possibly being the carrier of Philemon and 2 Timothy in addition to Colossians. And he is clearly useful to Paul. He's trustworthy to carry these critically, crucially important letters. And Paul describes Tychicus in three ways. Look at verse 7. He refers to him as our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow slave in the Lord. Tychicus had a heartfelt connection being beloved by both Paul and the Colossian believers. There was a fond affection for Tychicus, and not only was he beloved by others, but he was a faithful servant, and this should be the aspiration for every believer, for all of us, that we would be found faithful in whatever ministry the Lord grants to us in his service. Carrying letters roughly 1,100 miles requires a level of trustworthy commitment, and Tychicus clearly possessed this. Paul also refers to Tychicus as a bondservant, or better translated, a slave in the Lord. Tychicus did not serve at his own will, but the will of another. Jesus was his master, and it was his joy to be in service of his Lord. And Tychicus is tasked to bring the letter, but also a report. Look again at the end of verse 7. And then into verse 8. It says, Tychicus, and then moving up, will bring you information. In verse 8. 
For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. This additional information that he's to bring to them is most likely information pertaining to more personal matters regarding Paul that he didn't want to clutter up the letter with. These things would most likely include things pertaining to his condition while imprisoned, his health, and other things pertaining to his welfare. So Paul is sending Tychicus, and then he's also sending Onesimus for the specific purpose that they fill the readers in on his circumstances and that they might encourage their hearts. The other faithful representative being sent was Onesimus. Look at verse 9 at what Paul has to say about him. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. And then again, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Tychicus and Onesimus are traveling partners. We know some of Onesimus' past from the book of Philemon. He was a slave of Philemon and seems to have robbed Philemon and then sought to escape by fleeing to Rome. However, at some point, most likely in Rome, he seems to have come into contact with Paul and was brought to faith in Christ. His life was transformed, and now he is described as faithful and beloved as well. Prior to Christ, he could not have been known as faithful as he was a thief and a deserter. Yet his new life in Christ is matching his new man identity in union with Christ, and he is faithful. Yet it also seems that he has some things to to work through, to clean up from his past, and he apparently is more than willing to do so. Onesimus went from being an unfaithful slave to Philemon to now a faithful slave of Christ. He will also be participating in the report regarding Paul's situation and once a runaway slave to now a useful servant of the gospel and one who had important, pertinent information as an emissary of Paul. Tychicus and Onesimus were faithful, usable, sendable servants for the progress of the gospel ministry. And how sweet is this report? Just think for a moment how wonderful it would be to hear of the transformation that God has brought to pass in the life of these men. Two men from very different circumstances and yet both unified in Christ because of Christ's work and now useful for the Lord. And listen, there's just hope in this account for each one of us. Whatever the sins of your past, whatever your identity was prior to Christ, there is redemption found in him. There is forgiveness of sins. There is newness of life. There is usefulness for the Lord. And we can trust him with that. We can find hope in that. A couple thoughts on this for consideration. Are you one who would be characterized by faithfulness? By faithful service? Does the pattern of your life and the the nature of your diligence reflect a faithfulness to the things that God has entrusted into your care? Maybe another question, are are you sendable for gospel ministry? Listen, every, every need may not be met by each individual. But each of us should aspire to never have our not participating in a need be because of our personal character. We should be the kind of people that are sendable for whatever task may come about. That should be our aim. That should be what we strive for. Maybe another question to consider, is your participation in the church intimate enough that you would be considered a beloved one in the body of Christ? Do you know people? Do people know you? Do you have relationships with others? Have you given of yourself in love and care for others? Paul's closing care for the Colossian church highlights God's instruments for gospel ministry. First, we saw the faithful representatives being sent, and next we're going to see the fellow laborers' warm greeting. That's number two, the fellow laborers' warm greeting. Warm greeting. 
In verses 10 through 14, we see a a bit of a rapid-fire, warm, or endearing greeting from fellow laborers for the gospel. These are more of God's instruments of whom he is using to press forth gospel ministry. And Paul begins with three individuals that he says in verse 11 are from the circumcision, meaning they are Jewish converts with him laboring for the gospel. And then the latter three are Gentiles, that is, they are non-Jewish converts to Christianity who are also laboring with Paul. In verse 10, Paul's, Paul says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greeting. Aristarchus was from Thessalonica and had accompanied Paul on many of his endeavors. From the riot that broke out in Ephesus to being a companion on his voyage that they went on, As a prisoner to Rome that nearly cost them all their lives, he was a man who was with Paul through all of the victories and challenges of ministry, and even now he's imprisoned with Paul. And then we see Barnabas' cousin, Mark, about whom he received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. This is Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, who also is the Mark that had a rough start. He had a rough beginning with Paul. In Acts 13, he went with Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey, but when things got especially difficult, Mark abandoned the mission. Two chapters later, however, in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas are going on a second trip. Mark is there again wanting to go, and Barnabas was willing to give him a second chance, but Paul was not, and this created significant conflict. Yet listen to what Paul tells Timothy about Mark 12 years later in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. He says, pick up Mark and bring him with you because he is useful to me for service. He didn't start out faithful, but he became useful to the point of significant lasting encouragement to Paul. And again, I found this incredibly encouraging. Have you ever felt like you just, you failed what God calls you to be as a Christian, you've dropped the ball, you've missed it. We don't, we don't start 10 miles down the road at the moment of salvation. God is patient. He sanctifies his people, he grows us, and there is usefulness for us still yet. Next, we see Justice. We don't know much about him except for what it says here. His name is Jesus, but he goes by his Hellenistic Roman name, which is Justice, which means righteous. It is possible that this was granted to him in light of his character. And Paul has this to say about his three friends. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision. They are the only converted Jewish friends that were around Paul at this time of imprisonment and difficulty, and they proved to be an encouragement to him. Gospel ministry is difficult at times. It is hard, and even the Apostle Paul benefited from encouragement. This body does this so well for its leaders in many ways. First of all, the greatest source of encouragement is simply to press on in faithfulness to Christ, to obey him, to love one another, to flee from sin and to pursue holiness. And yet, tangible expressions of encouragement are also a true blessing as well. Even this week, I received multiple texts and emails from individuals in this body simply to express love and appreciation. What a gift that is. What a kindness. That is so helpful. And apparently these men were a source of encouragement for Paul as well, and undoubtedly that was helpful for him. Verse 12 on, we see the Gentile co-labors. Epaphras sends his greetings. Do you see that there in verse 12? He says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings. Epaphras was a fellow servant of the Lord who was from Colossae. He traveled to Ephesus at some point prior. He gets saved there, hearing the gospel from Paul. And then Epaphras ends up later on in jail with Paul and is there and observes that Epaphras is a faithful brother. Look at verses 12 and 13. 
Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. And Paul says in verse 13, for I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Aeropolis. Paul is testifying on behalf of his co-laborer, co-laborer that he has a, a deep concern, a real passion. Epaphras is from Colossae and was most likely their pastor. He too is a slave of Jesus Christ and sends his greetings. And Paul says he is always laboring in prayers. And Paul testifies of this. There is an earnestness. And all, not only for them, but for those in Laodicea and Aeropolis, neighboring cities. And his pastoral heart shines through in his constant prayers that they would stand perfect or fully assured in all the will of God. To stand perfect is to stand mature or complete or brought to their intended purpose. This is the same idea as why Paul says he labors to see each man complete in Christ. Do you remember that from chapter 1? He also prays that they would be fully assured in all the will of God. He desires them to have a fullness of conviction about God's will for their lives and God's purposes for them. The next in verse 14, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. This is Luke who wrote the gospel of Luke and Acts. Luke left his position as a doctor and was a, a faithful, loyal companion for Paul to the very end. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul tells Timothy that only Luke is with me, and in God's divine sovereignty, we get an interesting contrast in the last person mentioned being Demas. Where Luke left his position as a doctor and was not tied to the things of the world, Demas, as we also know from 2 Timothy 4, left service of the Lord for what the world offers. And in the two men being sent, in the six men here referenced, three being Jews and three Gentiles, we have to just marvel at the work of Christ in the gospel. You have, a free, you have free men, you have a slave, you have Gentiles, you have Jews, all being useful for gospel ministry. And the work of Christ in the gospel leaves no room for bounds or prejudices. There is a unity in Christ being bound to him that, as Paul mentioned in chapter 3, abolishes distinctions. Each of their identities bound up supremely in Christ. Paul's closing care for the Colossian church highlights God's instruments for gospel ministry. We saw first the faithful representatives being sent. We just looked at the fellow laborers, warm greeting. And now number three, as Paul wraps up his letter, we see the final instructions from a beloved minister. The final instructions from a beloved minister. Paul closes this letter with some final instructions. Look at verse 15. He says, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. Laodicea was a neighboring city. Paul has already mentioned them in chapter 2, verse 1, and then we just saw in chapter 4, verse 13. And they are to also greet Nympha and the church that is in her house. It was common practice at this time for churches to meet in homes of those among them. And the fact that Paul mentions all the brethren in Laodicea and then he also mentions the church that is Nympha's house, leaves it unclear if there are multiple churches in Laodicea or possibly a church that met outside of Laodicea. Possibly this was the church in Aeropolis. Nevertheless, while we know very little about Nympha, we can surmise that she was most likely a widow who had sufficient wealth to own a home large enough to host gatherings of a church in her house, and she was hospitable to do so. And we start to see this pattern unfold time after time of real life personal people being used for gospel ministry for the Lord. Ordinary, regular, redeemed Christians engaged in gospel ministry faithfully. In verse 16, Paul says, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. 
Paul was concerned that these letters get shared fully to every believer in that area, that that each believer would be exposed to all of Paul's writing, and this letter was to be read among the congregation. This message was for the collective church, and it was beneficial for them to hear it together. This letter was to be passed to the Laodiceans, and there was apparently another letter that the Laodiceans had and were to share with the Colossians. While this letter was important to have passed on from the Laodiceans to the Colossians, yet that letter was not inspired scripture as God in his wisdom and sovereign power determined not to include that letter in the canon of scripture. Can you imagine missing church that Sunday? We got a letter from the Colossians. We read it on Sunday. Wait, what? Or we got a letter from Paul for us as the Colossians. and We read it on Sunday. Oh, I missed it. That would be tragic. I'm sure they filled him in. And then look at verse 17. Paul says, Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Now, all we know of Archippus is what we find here and what we see in Philemon 2, where he is called our fellow soldier. It is believed that Archippus has taken on some role of spiritual leadership or oversight of the congregation in Colossae, and it is possible he served under or alongside of Epaphras, and in his absence, he took on an even greater leadership role in the church. And in Paul telling Archippus to take heed to the ministry which he had received in the Lord, he's calling him to give continual attention or care to his ministry. Embrace what God has set for you to do for him. And this is a helpful reminder. Whatever ministry the Lord has for you today, take heed of that ministry and be faithful in it. Fulfill it continually, diligently, joyfully. What ministry has God given you today and what would faithful fulfillment of that ministry most look like? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. And there's often a temptation to give more careful attention to how others are fulfilling their ministry to you rather than a joyfully embracing of what God has called us to do and to be. The church would be far stronger if each of us, as our great ambition, was to be faithful. Paul closes this letter in verse 18. Look again at verse 18. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. It's very well may be that Paul had someone else recording the writing of this letter for him, but what is clear is the personal touch that Paul closed with using his own hand. Its readers could be fully assured that this letter was from Paul. Then he says, remember my imprisonment. The Colossians were to think of and feel for Paul in regards to his imprisonment, and Paul is not giving a plea for sympathy Remember his request in chapter 4, verse 3, where he says, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. Paul is imprisoned for the sake of the great gospel mystery he preached and remembering Paul's bonds should stimulate the readers to stand firm as Epaphras also ever prays that they would on their behalf. Remembering Paul's imprisonment wasn't to have pity on Paul, but to be emboldened in their own personal faith. And then finally, Paul closes with grace be with you. And Paul began his letter with grace in verse 2 of chapter 1, and now he closes the letter with the blessing of grace extended to them. The you is plural, meaning it is you all, grace be with you all. And while each individual must experience God's grace personally, God intends the fullness of his grace to be known and enjoyed most fully in the context of Christian community. 
And here we see that Paul gives individual care and encouragement to various people and ends with a collective blessing of grace. As we wrap up the book of Colossians, I found this ending rather helpful. Just to speak personally for a moment, I found Paul's closing with such affectionate care for individuals personally incredibly encouraging. There are times where Colossians has felt so lofty, so extreme, just looking at Christ in all of his splendor. Jesus rescued us. He's the image of the invisible God. Jesus created everything. He holds everything together by his power. Jesus is the head of the church, the supreme reconciler, and I'm to walk in him I'm to have the daily habitual pattern of my life be consistent with that one. I've been unified with him and the expectation is a habitual setting of my mind on things above. I'm to fight sin actively, dealing mortal blows to immorality and other such sins and I'm to be humble and patient. I'm to forgive offenses quickly. I'm to love and so on. And it almost felt like unattainable, idealistic standards. And then as Paul closes his letters, his letter, you remember Paul is imprisoned with real companions. These are real people. He's writing to real people who are part of an imperfect church who needs shepherding and encouragement and pastoral care and theological bolstering and practical instruction for living. And you see men like Onesimus, who was a thieving runaway slave who is now useful to Paul and is a faithful and beloved brother. And you just realize, I I can't attain these things on my own. I can't meet this standard on my own. And that's the whole point of the Christian life. We cannot do it. That's the beauty of Christ. Christ. And the blessing of the church and there is hope for these realities to be ever-growing realities in our lives. As we press on in our love for Jesus-fueled pursuit of personal holiness. With our hope being that it's, it's not us. We've been crucified with Christ. But Christ lives in us. We have a hope that is founded on something outside of ourselves to be what God calls us to be, to live as God calls us to live. And if we're not living in the fullness of that today, press on each day seeking to be faithful with that day and watch God's Holy Spirit, watch him move within our hearts and conform us more to the image of Christ as he uses his word and his people to grow us and sanctify us. The book of Colossians is not a super Christian manual. This is what it means to be a Christian. And yes, we don't live it perfectly all the time, but the habitual pursuit and pattern of our life is to be one that is consumed with the things of Christ and pursuing him, not a contentment with lesser things not pertaining to Jesus. And if Christian living seems extreme to you, When you read biblical instruction, you may not understand what it means to truly deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. I I will say this, whatever the cost may be for you to follow Jesus, whatever that cost is, whatever the cost is that you have to forsake to gain Christ, it is worth it. He is worth it. And your greatest aid to living this life that is faithful to God, your greatest hope to be fortified in your faith is to hold an unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. He is the ultimate treasure. He is the ultimate gift. He is the ultimate gift of grace to us. Do you know him? Do you know this wonderful Savior? Before you is the offer 
of eternal fellowship with the creator of the heavens and the earth brought about by the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus, so that we might be reconciled, have union with him, have new life in him, have peace and hope and comfort and joy in him. To live for him in union with him is an unparalleled privilege and joy. Let us hold an unwavering conviction regarding Christ's supremacy and sufficiency that we would be fortified in our faith and that we would press on in faithfulness to God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your intimate, personal care for your people. That you would preserve your word. That we could know you and know these truths about you. That we could know your desires for your people. That we could know what is right and good before you. And I pray that you would use uh, this time that we've had together in the book of Colossians for our good, for our our growth in you, a strengthening of our faith, a deepening of our conviction to live for you above all else, that we would be holy before you, that we would please you in all regards, that we would walk faithfully in light of the work that you have done in your son on our behalf. Thank you that these rich, deep, eternally awe-inspiring truths about you, Lord, have come to us. And thank you that they they don't simply sit far off from us, but they affect us. They impact our hearts and our thinking. Help us to be useful servants, to press forward your gospel ministry. Thank you for the way that you're already doing that. What a joy it is to be a part of this body who loves you and loves your son and loves holiness and hates sin and cares for one another so well. Help us to excel still more in these things, that we would be found faithful, good slaves of an infinitely good master. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.